Hi guys, I hope you're all well. This may look familiar to anybody who checked in last week. This is our Lenovo X1 Carbon Gen 3 motherboard. And I still have it for a few days, so I'm going to go a bit more in depth into looking at how this works. This is a functioning motherboard before we go any further. So what I'm doing is just taking down uh, some details on how it works. Um, so you might remember from last week, our power adapter comes in here onto these, this pin here and this pin here. It then goes to our fuse. Then it jumps over to our two MOSFETs here and then jumps over to our current sense resistor here. So after this point we have 20.4 volts and this is our main power rail. So I checked around the board and I could find that 20.4 volt here, 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 here and at the input to a number of the other circuits because this 20.4 volt is going to be the input voltage to the regulation chips that produce the 1.3 volts for the RAM, the 5 volts for the USB, the 1 volt for the processor etc etc. So it is expected that we find that 20.4 volts uh, as the input to a number of the other circuits around the board. So now that we've confirmed that that main 20.4 volts power rail uh, is up and running what do you do next? Well, what we need to do is we need to make sure that our 3.3 volt power rail is also online and that it's on our power button on our startup chip. So that's what I'm going to do next. Now, I do actually have a schematic for this motherboard, but we don't always have a schematic for these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I would do if I don't have a schematic. All right. So you can see that on all of these ICs here, they're clearly marked the model number of each of them. Let me zoom in just so you can see a few. So there you have BD4177GS. That's Tink Engine. So it's, I think that's produced by Lenovo. I think that's one of their trademarks. You have an SMSC MEC1633L. And on this one over here, you can see we have a Samsung. Uh, let's get a close in on that. So you can clearly see on each of the ICs that there is a model number. So if I took that one, for example, and all I want to do is Google that model number. And when I Google it, you'll see that this is what that chip is there. It's in Samsung DDR3. So it seems like on this model number of laptop, the memory is fixed onto the motherboard. And these are the little... I don't know what they are, they must be one gig each or something like that. Maybe somebody can put it down in the comments because there's four this side and there's four on the other side. But that's how you can Google it to find out what the chip does. Now the more eagle-eyed among you might have spotted earlier on that this chip right here looks the sort of package that you would expect one of these 3.3 volt always on chips to come in. And if you see there, TPS51220A, that's a common chip for the purpose of producing your 3.3 volts always on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Google that as well. And when I Google it, I can pull up a full data sheet for it. And what you can see right here is that this is, there's our model number TPS 51220A, fixed frequency 99% duty cycle, peak current mode, notebook system, power controller. The names of these are just so long though. Um, but what we need to know about this thing is it producing our 3.3 volts. Okay, so what I see here on this is we've got a lot of pins on this, but we're really just concerned about two things. Is there voltage going into it and is there voltage going out? And what I can see here is that this V in pin right here, which is 23, so we need to check and make sure we have 20.4 volts on this. And we have a VREG3 and a VREG5 right here. So we need to check that the two of these have 3.3 uh, volts and 5 volts respectively. So that's what it looks like on the data sheet. I'm going to zoom in a bit more onto the actual chip itself and we're going to take a look at it from there. Now rather than have to match an upside down chip to an upside down data sheet, I've flipped the board around 180 degrees and taken a closer up picture of the TPS 51220A. As you can see, the tracks didn't come out great, so I had to manually fill those out myself in Photoshop. And here are the pinouts right here. So now we can compare our chip to our pinouts and try and work out which of the pins we should be expecting to find our 3.3 volts always on. On my chip, I can see there's a little dot right here. That indicates that this is pin number one. 
So counting around, we can see that 23 is our voltage in. So that corresponds to this pin right here. So if I go along that track right up here, I can see that this large capacitor here is where I should expect to find our input voltage. And when I measure on this in volts DC, I find that there is 20.4 volts on this pin. So that's as expected. So we have the proper input voltage to this IC. The question then is, is the IC producing the right 3.3 volts always on and 5 volts always on? Well, I can identify that from our VREG3 right here. That's on pin 22. So you can certainly measure it by getting a small probe and you know connect here. It's best not to do that most of the time because there is the chance these chips are really small and I've zoomed in quite a bit here. So when you're measuring on the pins of the chip itself, there is a chance that you could cross them and like like that and you know possibly damage the chip. I think I did that in another video actually. So it's safer to identify the pin. That's 22 and it is connected to the capacitor right here. All of the voltage in and voltage outs will have a local bypass capacitor anyway. So as long as you find out where the pin goes to, you can measure at the capacitor. So I measure right here and I find that there's 3.3 volts on this capacitor right here. You can also check 29, which is our 5 volts always on. That corresponds to this one right here. So if I place my probe right here, I find that there's 5 volts on this. And that tells me that my TPS 51220A is functioning properly. Just one other point on this TPS 51220A before we move on. What we've identified here is that we have our voltage in uh, 20.4 volts input and we have our low current linear 3.3 volt output and our low current linear 5 volt output on this pin here. But what you'll find is when the laptop is powered on, S W1 and SW2 are enabled and they produce a higher current uh, 5 volt on this one here and 3.3 volts here. So just to avoid any confusion here, I flipped the board back over here and this is my original picture so you can see my TPS 51220A chip here is upside down again. But we know our 3.3 volts always on is working. So what I can find then is on this capacitor right here, there's normally one capacitor. This is a startup chip here, it's SMSC and if you Google that again, you'll find out that it's an IO controller is what they call it. But this is our startup chip here and if I measure right here, volts DC again, I find that there is 3.3 volts on this. Let me just get it closer here. Okay, so there's 3.3 volts on this here as there should be. So at this point we've verified that our TPS 51220A has 20.4 volts on the input and it is generating our 3.3 volts always on and our 5 volts always on. That 3.3 volts always on is present at our Super IO chip and we're now just trying to find that on our power switch, our power button. So I flipped the motherboard as you can see. This is the other side of the board which we haven't really seen. And this connector right here, J48, is where our external power board connects into. Obviously I had to disconnect it here because uh, I needed to take a pretty good picture of it. So that is where it plugs in right there, J48. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pins on this connection. So what I do is I bling bling, I bring my black probe, place it to ground, switch my multimeter to volts DC and I introduce my red probe. So I've gone along each of these pins and what I found is that there is 3.3 volts on pin number 6. I verified this in the schematic and what happens is with the power button plugged in, if I press the power button that 3.3 volts goes to zero because like with most power buttons it temporarily grounds the 3.3 volts and sends that signal back to the super IO and that's how it powers on. That concludes our quick tour of the 3.3 volts always on power rail for this Lenovo X1 Carbon Gen 3. However, before I leave, I just want to point out something. This is the pinout diagram for that TPS 51220A. Now, when you're first looking at this and you're trying to troubleshoot it, you see 32 pins on it and you think, I'm looking into the abyss here. Am I really going to be able to take down the values of 32 pins on this chip 
then somehow find another motherboard, compare it to the 32 values on that, and somehow work out the difference that way? Or can I get those 32 values, look up the data sheet, and try and work it out from you know what the pins are meant to be doing? It's not really feasible to do something like that. All I really need to know with this chip, and it's similar for other the other secondary circuits as well that produce you know the 1.3 volts for the RAM on this DDR3, uh, and you know lower voltages the 1.8 for the chipset or whatever whatever else is on this motherboard. I want to know two things: Am I getting the correct voltage in? And am I getting the correct voltage out? On this, as you saw earlier, I measured on the VIN pin right up here. I had my 20.4 volt from my main uh, power rail on this Lenovo. That was correct, so I know I have the correct voltage in on that pin. And I measure on the capacitor on the output VREG3. I have 3.3 volts. So you can be pretty sure that that chip is doing what it should be doing. And that's the sort of approach I tried to take to this. You have to be sort of, you have to take a sort of a simple approach to this because it's just not feasible. There are more pins on some of the other chips as well. You couldn't go around to 64 pins on a chip, write it all down in Excel, get another laptop, compare all those values and somehow try and work it out. So it's just to try and keep it manageable and that you don't like spend a year trying to work out what is wrong with one of these little chips. So on the that note I'm going to leave it there for this week um, again I didn't really have anything that's interesting it's just broken back covers we're seeing a lot of those on the Dells at the moment repairing hinges and screens and stuff like that um, I also had a Dyson Hoover in I thought that was going to make a really good video until I found out that the plug had been stretched on it and I'm not making a video on how to wear a plug I'm sorry <laughs> there's enough of those up already but look uh, thanks for all the comments this week by the way there was a few nice comments um, but I'm going to keep putting up these videos and hopefully I'll have something a bit more interesting next week if not we'll just take another laptop that's working and work through it in the same way that I've worked through this so I hope you all have a good week and I'll be back next Sunday <laughs>